Thank you very much. Kindly take your seats. So I was very impressed when you rolled out the organizers of this conference. And um, it was predominantly female. And there was a rare male, you know, amongst them. Um, it reminded me of when I was a member of the Pan-African Parliament. The protocol that governed membership was that each country, however big or small, was entitled to five members, at least one of which must be a woman. You can bet Nigeria, Ghana, and all the other countries had four men and one woman. <laughs> the only exception was Lesotho. And I've always spoken proudly of this. Lesotho had four women and one man. <laughs> and I'm very glad to come and see that this beautiful conference that has been organized has predominantly been steered by our women, female counterparts. It's truly a testimony that whatever a man can do, women can do even better. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be back here at Harvard and to have the opportunity to share some perspectives at this well-organized conference. And it's gratifying to note that the conversation on Africa's future and development continues to be broadened and is occupying the thoughts of some of its most brilliant minds within and outside the continent and has found prominence in a prestigious institution such as this. I've been asked by the organizers to speak to how Africa can shake off the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and one, find, a, find new ways to bring value chains inside Africa's borders and two, change the mindset of dependence on external parties, redefine Africa's position in a changing geopolitical environment and ensure that Africa is creating sustainable institutions that will lead to growth, pride and prosperity for all its people. I intend to be quite specific in my approach to this subject, but permit me to take a brief historical detour in order to set a clear context for this discussion. I'm a historian and I studied history for my first degree. And I often find that many of the complex developmental problems the African continent grapples with have historical undertones. An appreciation of that history often lends itself to deeper insights into the matters that we're dealing with today. I also happen to come from Ghana, a country that was somewhat of a pioneer in the efforts to emancipate the continent and set it on a path of sustainable development. I'm sure most of you would know that Ghana was the first country south of the Sahara, sub-Saharan African country to emerge from colonial domination. But when I say we're pioneers, we're pioneers in gaining independence and then we're pioneers again in dispatching our first president through a coup d'etat. <laughs> Unlike other parts of the world, our route to development has been a checkered and arduous quest littered with many setbacks. We suffered colonial exploitation and domination under which we were viewed as little more than suppliers of raw materials and cheap labor to catalyze the industrialization of the West. A desire to break this yoke of domination lit a fire in our forebears, like Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, Kenneth Kaunda, Sekuture, among many others to launch a sustained campaign for independence after which they hoped economic development would surely follow. Post-colonial Africa was buzzing with the hope for a new vibrant industrialized continent. Then came the debate and tussle about ideological alignments, which development model best suited newly independent states. There were those of the socialist stock who modeled their national affairs around a state-controlled economy anchored on an industrial drive. And my country, Ghana, was one of them. We had the electricity company of Ghana, indeed in every sector. We had the state transport company if you wanted to travel, wanted to travel across the length and breadth of the country. 
We had a state housing corporation if you wanted to buy a house. We had a Gihok shoe factory if you wanted to buy shoes. We had the Gihok brick and tile factory if you wanted to build a house. Indeed, every sector was dominated by um, the state. Most of the private sector could be found in commerce and trading. But even then, the state gave them a run for the money, for their money with the Ghana National Trading Corporation that controlled most of the department stores all across the country. The other African countries that adopted a more Western developmental model and set about building their nations principally on a capitalist private sector-led model. Before any of these experiments could turn out tangible outcomes, disruptions of the political and governance system soon emerged, with military interventions becoming the order of the day. There are few African countries that were spared the turbulence and attendant economic and social decline that this brought. Several decades of military dictatorship led to the inevitable conclusion that a return to constitutional and democratic governance with regular elections was the most viable path to development. With democratic reforms came renewed efforts to resolve the economic fallouts of bad governance on the continent. Many African countries turned to the Bretton Woods institutions and adopted various structural adjustments and economic reform programs with varying outcomes. Again, Ghana is a pioneer in this, one of the first to go into uh, structural adjustment with the IMF. And I think in the life of our country, we've had almost 15 to 16 uh, programs with the IMF. Compared to where we have come from, incremental progress has been made. There are many success stories where many African countries are well run on the basis of democratic principles and sound governance. In the last decade, many of the fastest growing economies in the world have been in Africa. These gains notwithstanding, we still lag behind other continents in several metrics and developmental indices. Our economies remain largely underdeveloped, with many still operating the colonial economic model of raw material export and little manufacturing and industrialization. Weak governance institutions and corruption are major obstacles on our continent. Africa is demographically the youngest continent. With it has come a youth bulge that in turn has spawned a growing unemployment crisis which constitutes a major threat to the security of many African countries as the Arab Spring demonstrated. Insecurity, terrorism and insurgency plague quite a number of countries and have become protracted problems which continue to defy efforts at resolution. I've laid this historical foundation to drive home the point that Africa has significant fragilities that make us particularly vulnerable to the effects of global disruptions such as the pandemic we're just coming out of. We're always going to be the hardest hit by a phenomenon of that magnitude. The COVID-19 pandemic was therefore a most unwelcome and unpleasant eventuality that impacted the continent severely. Data from the Economic Commission of Africa, ECA, shows that COVID-19 created the continent's worst recession in 50 years, with real GDP shrinking by 3%, in, averagely by 3% in 2020. Before the pandemic, poverty reduction was already a major challenge. The pandemic is estimated to have dragged about 55 million more people into poverty in Africa and exposed another 46 million more to the risk of hunger and malnourishment. Indeed, 70% of hunger in Africa, which had already been on the rise since 2014, is directly attributable to this pandemic. Like governments all over the world, it became necessary for African governments to take action to shield their populations from the effects of the epidemic. This meant in many cases an increase in deficits due to unbudgeted expenditures. This has devastated many African economies and sunk them deeper into unsustainable debt and economic downturn. The pandemic has had a generally deleterious effect on the economy of African nations, 
But some countries have ridden the wave more successfully than others based on the resilience of their economies, discipline, and prudent use of their resource envelopes in the period of this crisis. In my country, Ghana, our economy has emerged in extremely poor shape from the COVID experience. A ballooning deficit, double-digit inflation, a nose-diving currency, increasing debt distress are some of the symptoms of a very ill economy. Ghana's case was easy to predict with the cavalier handling of the economy by the current administration, unbridled borrowing from the capital markets, creative misstatements of budget deficits and other critical fiscal figures were starting to come to a head eventually. Ghana went into the pandemic without adequate buffers and has emerged with a terribly battered economy. To make matters worse, a pandemic windfall of in excess of 33 billion Ghana cities, which could have cushioned the economy, remains unaudited and is believed to have been used largely in the quest to win election 2020 at all costs. The pandemic has laid bare once again the inherent weakness in our public health delivery systems and our social welfare systems. Take, for instance, the testing of COVID-19 globally. A report compiled by McKinsey and company showed that by May 2020, only 11 people per thousand had been tested in Mauritius, which had Africa's best record in that regard and had a population of 1.3 million as compared to 166 per thousand people in Iceland with a population of about 300,000 people. In Ghana, we could manage testing for 5.5 people per thousand for a population of 31 million people. Africa is still worse off in COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Out of 8 billion doses of vaccines distributed globally by the end of 2021, 3% had been administered on the continent, with only 8% of the over 1.2 billion living in Africa fully vaccinated. This compares with about 60% of vaccinations in high-income countries. It is my firm belief that Africa has survived COVID by the resilience imbued in us as a people by nature, and not by any skillful handling of the pandemic by any particular government. Most countries in Africa lifted enforcement of lockdown restrictions after just a couple of weeks, not motivated by any scientific considerations or superior knowledge of the disease and how to better handle it. It was due largely to the severe suffering that millions of people began to go through. With vast sections of the African population engaged in informal economic activity, even a day's absence from their trade meant that food could not be guaranteed for the household, and governments simply were not in a position to provide for those affected. It was always, always going to be an uphill task to rebound from the effects of the pandemic. Even as COVID-19 still lingers, and African countries attempt to reset their economies, yet another disruption, this time of a geopolitical nature, threatens to wreak more havoc on an already fragile continent. The Russia-Ukraine conflict is set to peg, peg Africa's growth back by an estimation of about 0.7%. Inflation is expected to rise by at least 2.2% in 2022, and as many as 43 countries that depend on energy and food imports will be confronted with fiscal and current account problems. Global energy prices, price increases have escalated the cost of living and compounded hardships in many countries. In the light of the above, the conversation is now about overcoming the twin problems of a lingering pandemic and its aftermath, and a geopolitical induced economic crisis, as opposed to one that focuses on just post-pandemic recovery. What are the most appropriate and beneficial steps that ought to be taken to first overcome this pandemic and then the effects of the Russia-Ukraine conflict.
There was a general euphoria that the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the arms race will accelerate global prosperity. The rise of globalization created an environment that admitted many parts of the world into the global economy, including Africa. Now we enter a most unpredictable era in our geopolitics. It's not a question of if there will be another global shock. It is a question of when. Several propositions have been put forward. The answer to this has been quite diverse, and many pathways have been offered by various thinkers and credible voices. I'm of the view that the best propositions must be situated within the context of the underlying problems that COVID-19 pandemic and lately the Russian-Ukraine war have exposed. One, there's a lack of resilience in African economies, inadequate public health systems, and virtually non-existent social welfare systems. The first order of business is to rebuild our economies and position them for sustainable growth over the medium to long term. If we needed to run in times past to bring our economies to adequate levels, at this moment we need to fly in order to overcome the setbacks occasioned by the pandemic and have the resilience to withstand any future shocks of this nature. In the short term, however, we will need all the help we can get. We are deeply appreciative of the support extended by multilateral organizations, such as the World Bank and the IMF, at the height of the pandemic. In Ghana, we received about a billion dollars to strengthen our response to the COVID pandemic from the IMF, and we received another about a little below $500 million from the World Bank to help us with the fight against the pandemic. Such help would have to be expanded and deepened to offer us a chance at carrying out the necessary steps to reform our economies and rebound strongly. The multilateral institutions have undergone reforms themselves and have come a long way from when the IMF was described by Kenneth Kaunda as being akin to a mad doctor who prescribed quinine no matter the illness. <laughs> Rising public debt which has been worsened by the pandemic has become a major binding constraint to our forward march. Many African countries, including Ghana, are heavily burdened and we have reached debt distress levels with debt to GDP ratios ranging between 70% and 80%. I would advocate for a reinstitution and extension of the debt service suspension initiative, that's the DSSI, to offer our countries some fiscal space so investments can be made in critical sectors like education and health and other social services, which at the moment are severely underfunded. Also, the common framework for debt treatment beyond the DSSI also requires expansion to grant African countries access to debt restructuring tools and mechanisms. The IMF's Resilience and Sustainable Trust, which aims to redistribute the share of countries with stronger external financing positions in the Special Drawing Rights, SDRs, set up for COVID-19 to weaker nations needs to be accelerated to offer the much-needed respite for these countries, mostly in Africa. An African version of a Marshall Plan is urgently needed, and I believe Africa must not shy away from seeking the support of these multilateral institutions and their bilateral partners when the need arises. It is important, however, for each country to develop its own homegrown fiscal consolidation program in working with these institutions as we did during our extended credit facility with the IMF. Beyond these short-term measures is, a really, is the real heavy lifting that African countries must do to build resilient and robust economies that can withstand future shocks at the heart of this is the need for major governance reforms that focus on the establishment of strong governance institutions that operate on the basis of efficiency to reduce waste of state resources to a minimum and tackle the age-old problems of corruption. Going forward, the present economic model, which revolves around poverty reduction and, allevi and poverty alleviation, would prove inadequate. <laughs> 
Our economies must have inbuilt resilience to wean us off dependency. The resilience must be rooted in the acquisition of the necessary know-how. Our education systems must emphasize modernity and have strong science, engineering, and mathematics components. Intra-African trade must be high on the agenda, and the work that had started with the establishment of the African Continental Free Trade Area must be seen to fruition to promote trade and commerce on the continent. Structural reforms leading to the diversification of our economies and production base and the attraction of investments into industry, agribusiness, the digital sector, and tourism must be accelerated. We must also push for self-reliance in key strategic commodities and supplies for which we have a comparative advantage. And when I talk about this, I talk about rice, vegetable oil, and things. It's such a shame if you look at the quantities of these commodities that Africa imports when we have all the conditions to produce them ourselves. Tomatoes, onions, and just about every toothpicks, you know, and just about everything. Africa must take greater control of the trade and processing of its natural resources like cocoa, gold, bauxite, oil, copper, etc., and build stronger capacity to respond to global energy shocks which have impinged heavily on our economies as a result of the current Russia-Ukraine conflict. We need to be able to deal more effectively with such shocks in future to mitigate, mitigate the suffering of our, peop of our people during such times. And when I talk about getting greater control of trade and processing of our natural resources, I use my own country as an example that after decades of cocoa production, still in excess of 60 to 70 percent of cocoa that we produce is exported as raw beans and processed in other countries. Ghana exports Last, last year, our export of gold was 130 tons worth in excess of $8 billion, and yet royalties and taxes brought just a little over $2 billion into the Ghanaian economy. This is what I mean when I talk about things like this. Ghana's share of oil production over 10 years is about $6.5 billion, and yet tens of billions, you know, have been exported out of dollars have, have been exported outside by partners. Windfalls from commodity exports in times of hikes should be channeled into the recovery effort and not squandered on mere consumption. One area that Africa has shown remarkable growth is the ICT sector and digital uptake. Before the pandemic, we were making major inroads in that area and we we're recording the fastest rate of new broadband connections and mobile data traffic was projected to rise by 700 percent between 2017 and 2020. E-commerce was growing in leaps and bounds in Africa, and our population was becoming more and more reliant on online trade uh, retailing. We need to leverage this level of growth to catalyze economic development in ways that we have not done before. The pandemic stretched the continent's already weak public health systems. Admittedly, this was also the case for the global health system, but ours took a beating and would not have been able to cope had the pandemic spread to the level that it did in more advanced countries. Our health systems urgently require fixing and recalibration to bring them up to a level where we can effectively deal with future occurrences, as is obvious with the COVID-19. This means investments must not be channeled into just into establishing medical facilities across the continent, but also importantly into research, training of personnel, and development to put us ahead of the curve and position us to respond rapidly to future emergencies. The systems and processes to make us self-sufficient in vaccine and medicine production, as well as the supply chain to timelessly deliver same should as well be put in place. And I'm happy to note that some countries have taken the lead to set up facilities for vaccine production for future pandemics. Transport networks and systems to ease supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic should also engage our attention to lessen the impact of future occurrences. The social welfare and safety nets need to 
ease and suit the suffering that a pandemic of this scale inflicts on vulnerable groups, and this is critical. The lesson that COVID-19 throws up for many African countries is that these systems simply don't exist, and even where they did, they proved insufficient and grossly underdeveloped to protect the poor and vulnerable. We can't afford to have the status quo persist. We must spring into action now and lay the foundations for delivering better outcomes for people and protect them against such harsh realities. These perspectives add on to those expressed by other participants at this event and those outlined by other prominent thinkers on the continent. A McKinsey and Company report published in the aftermath of the pandemic identified nine ways to surmount the effects of the pandemic with an overarching theme of reimagining ways things are done in Africa. The ECA also has made similar proposals. All these thoughts converge on the fundamental point that this pandemic and its fallout call for a radically new paradigm which Africa must reinvent itself and aim for much loftier and bolder ambitions than it currently holds. This is an existential imperative because the instruments we deploy in the journey towards economic development as outlined at the introduction of my remarks have become ineffective and in the wake of the current crisis we face. The pandemic and other geopolitical factors have created several new challenges which current thinking and methods cannot resolve. We need to think innovatively and to think outside the box. In some African countries, there have been overthrows of constitutional regimes and a return to military rule. This cannot be the solution to the problem. The current complexities of governance and integration of our economies into the wealth system are not amenable to military rule. What we need is deeper democracy, deeper freedom of expression, transparent and accountable governance, prudent use of our natural resources for the benefit of the people, decentralized administration that creates opportunities for all, no matter your gender, geographical location, or your political affiliation. There is hope for Africa, and this hope is evident in our human resource. It is in the critical thinking of our youth. The many young people I have interacted with back home and since I arrived here in Harvard gives me the strongest assurance that Africa will wake up to a new dawn. Out of the current adversity will emerge new opportunities. We must seize the moment and change the narrative of our continent being a basket case of poverty and suffering. This event and many more that I'm sure will follow will have their roles in the collective push for Africa's ultimate takeoff because they provide a melting pot for exchange of ideas which is vital to our overall efforts at this endeavor. The ideas would have to be generated first before they can be executed. I thank you all for your kind attention. <laughs>